I'd like to welcome you all to our exploration of the Gospel of John. And any time that we enter the Word of God, we always want to do that with the benefit of prayer. So let's begin by bowing our hearts. Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you, Father, for your Word incarnate that came and tabernacled among us. We thank you, Father, for this precious, precious book. We do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would open this book to our hearts and lives, that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of our coming King, and that we might be more effective stewards of the opportunities that you bring across our path. As we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen. So we're in the second session of the Gospel of John. And we're going to primarily focus on the part of chapter 1 we didn't get to last time. But since we do have some new people, and also just as a way of getting into the pace of things here, I'll spend a few moments reviewing what we did touch on last time. And last time I spent some substantial time up front with some background on what we call hermeneutical caveats. Hermeneutics is the study, the theory of interpretation. And everybody has a, an approach to the text, the biblical text. And uh, that's collectively called your hermeneutics. And, and we hold some very strange views. And I want to mention that, not that you have to agree with this, but you'll at least know where we're coming from. And we'll express many views that are controversial. We'll try to ex express both sides where we think it's justified. But again, I want to make, make it clear that we're not here to sell a viewpoint. We're anxious to help you become what we call a self-feeder understand the Bible enough so that you can find your own answers up. And uh, so what we share is really intended just to be supportive of your own uh, journey and adventure through the Scripture. And so we are very, very focused here on the integrity of design. We hold the view that, uh, that every detail, every number, every place name in these 66 books uh, that we call the Bible it's an integrated package. And once you discover that, it changes your whole view. And you also quickly discover that it had to have its origin from outside the dimensionality of time. That also causes us to really regard every detail as relevant. We hold the view that every number, every place name, every detail in the scripture is there by deliberate design. And when you discover that for yourself, it changes your whole perspective of the scripture. And uh, another view we have that we've discovered, in, especially in more recent years, we've come to the view that there are no synonyms, not real synonyms. Two words can be synonymous in that they mean almost the same thing. But watch out for that almost, because in their differences often lies a major discovery. So we're really, we've been drawn to, after 65 years of study, we, we've been drawn to the idea of precision, especially in eschatology. We start Eschatology's most uh, study of the last things is because it's most challenging because it requires everything else to fit into a pattern. But the other thing we did last time, there is a challenge that has become our trademark over more than four decades, and that's Acts 17:11. But we've also discovered that uh, it has aspects that we didn't fully appreciate until the last few years. So I want to talk a little bit about that challenge and specifically some background that emerges from that. So uh, the, the trademark verse that's been our trademark for many decades uh, comes out of Acts 17.11, where Luke deals with the people in uh, Berea. Um, they said these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, where they came from, in that they did two things. They received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to prove whether those things were so. And we've adopted that verse very early on the presumption that the emphasis, but all, the way I usually equip it, is that that's where Luke tells you don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you. But check it out for yourself. That's been our flavor of applying that trademark. But we've discovered that's not the most challenging part. The most challenging part of applying this verse is something we took for granted for many years. And that's to receive the word with all readiness of mind. And one of the things I've discovered is that most people have trouble with their Bible because of preconceptions or presuppositions they've been taught that are not true 
about the Bible or anything else for that matter. We carry presuppositions. And one of the secrets to learning is to set our presumptions or presuppositions aside to receive what's being said, to, to evaluate what's being said. And so that's to shed our erroneous... Pre- it's um, astonishing to me to discover how many of us have been programmed with erroneous information about our universe. And what's amazing to me is much of our concerns biblically come from misinformation about the, what we do know about the universe. So the Berean challenge is part B that I used to emphasize, the idea of searching the scriptures, because it is the only reliable source of truth. One of our challenges in life is to really find out what's true. And uh, the, the, the word there is anacrino, to investigate or examine, to prove, you search the scriptures to prove whether those things are really so. But it's part A that I took for granted for most of my career that I begin to realize in more recent years is really the problem that most people have to overcome in a variety of ways. Some people have misinformation about the Bible that gets in the way. Most of the people we deal with have information that comes from so-called science that is uh, in the way. So misconceptions and prejudices of inaccuracies and myopia about reality. And so it's in that vein there's another aspect that we talked about in some depth last time, and I'll hit it very lightly this time just to give you a perspective here. Uh, and that is to realize that we have, we've discovered there are boundaries to our, what we call reality. I use the Vitrupia of, Anand of, of uh, Da Vinci to represent man's reach. And if I want to deal with that which is larger than man, uh, and size goes, increases to the right on the little diagram here, if, if I'm going to get the larger world, we call the macrocosm. That's our universe. And uh, that takes us into the field of astronomy and astrophysics. And it may shock you to discover, and I won't get into it all here, but most of what you've probably been taught about astronomy turns out not to be true. It's not gravity-driven outside the solar system. So uh, that leads to all kinds of other errors in thinking. We know the key thing about 20th century science is that we now know the universe is finite. And that's a profound discovery. That's what leads to the speculations about the Big Bang and all those kinds of things. We know the universe may be expanding, but it's finite. It's not infinite. Well, if we go the other way and look at smallness, we get into even a bigger shock, and that is that there's a limit to smallness. And uh, that leads us to quantum physics and subatomic particles and all of that. The main thing there is that they've discovered is that everything, whether it's length, mass, energy, or time, is made up of indivisible units. They call them quanta collectively. But uh, there's lengths that you cannot divide. You get down to that 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, you try to divide that, it loses a property called locality. That thing that you're trying to divide is suddenly everywhere in the universe at the same time. That doesn't make sense to the average person. Uh, It doesn't make sense in a lot of ways. But that is what quantum physics has discovered and proven beyond beyond a dispute. So the point I'm getting at is if we put what we know of the universe in perspective, we know there's a limit to largeness. It's finite, not infinite. And there's a limit to smallness. That everything is made up of indivisible units, which means that we are in an, a digital simulated environment. And uh, now, that which is larger than large and smaller than small is collectively the metacosm. It's, it embraces what's largeness and smallness altogether. And the metacosm is the region in which most of the Bible deals, whether it's angels or demons or whatever, you're in the metacosm, not in the physical world as we sense it. And so we want to understand that. And this is not a fringe perspective. In the June issue of 2005, Scientific American had an article which pointed out the our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. And that caught my eye because that's exactly what the Bible has been saying all along. And we need to understand that. By understanding that, it suddenly makes a lot of other things clear because we're going to discover in every field of science, the frontier has already been anticipated in the biblical text. And that's a study of its own right. Well, let's get into the Gospel of John. One thing he does, he does it late in his book, but he tells you why he wrote it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke really just write a history. But John is quite clear that he's not writing a, an a, a, a essay in the traditional sense. It's an Abed piece. It's a, it's, he's, he's, expressed, he's, he's designed this to convince you of something. 
John says, and many other signs. At the end of his writing, you'll find this in chapter 20. And many other signs truly to Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Now this word Christ, by the way, if you get the International Standard Version Bible, the latest newest one out, you'll discover the word Christ does not appear in the New Testament. They use the word Messiah. Same word, but it carries the Jewish root, if you will, because that's what we're dealing with. Many people, Jesus Christ, they think that's his last name. No, 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 it's a title. And, uh, but, uh, so we, we shouldn't have any problem with that here. He has an agenda. John's writing this that ye might have life through his name. That's his goal. He has an objective, and he's unabashed about it. And uh, he says many other signs. John picks seven of them. There are dozens in the other Gospels. In fact, there's five of the seven are unique to John. So he's picked these deliberately because it, it's the seven signs. Changing, we're next, in the next session that we go, we're going to, in chapter two, we're going to count the strange, the first miracle he does is changing water into wine at Cana. And, and uh, why? And what's all about, that all about? Then later on, chapter four, he'll heal the official's son in Capernaum. He'll heal an invalid by the pool of Bethesda and feeding the 5,000 near the Sea of Galilee. He walks on the water in chapter six, healing the blind man in Jerusalem and raising dead Lazarus at Bethany. He selected these seven out of many dozens, and he did it with a, 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 a particular reason. Five of these, by the way, are unique to John's gospel. But something else you'll encounter in his gospel, seven times Jesus makes a, what I call an I am statement. And he claims in chapter 8 to be the voice of the burning bush. Many people are shocked by that. But seven I am statements. I am the bread of life in chapter 6. I am the light of the world in chapter 8. I am the gate for the sheep in chapter 10. I am the good shepherd in that same chapter. Uh, I am the resurrection and the life in chapter 11. Incident, of course, to the Lazarus event. And uh, then I am the true vine in chapter 15. And so he makes these seven I am statements, which causes, this is one of the reasons I suspect, I don't know of a lot of other scholars that hold this view. I may be in a, a small minority here. But I'm among those that's becoming convinced that John wrote his gospel after his experience at the island of Patmos. Near the later part of his life, as you know, he was in exile at Patmos. That's where he had the, the experience that led to the book of Revelation. He then retires at Ephesus for, many, for some years and writes his gospel. See, when you read the book of Revelation, it's clearly choreographed signs that all fit to 777 and so forth. When you read the Gospel of John, you don't notice it unless you look for it. But once you're sensitive to it, you suddenly see it everywhere. It is just as tightly designed or choreographed as the book of Revelation is. It's just done with a softer touch. You don't, you're not as conscious of it, if you will. And I think, I, I suspect that he had the benefit of the insights of Revelation when he wrote the Gospel, by the way. It's, that's just a hypothesis. Uh, you can come to your own conclusions as you get more familiar with the book. Let's just jump right in and we get, con with John, we get confronted right up front with uh, the first couple of verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, casual reading, it sounds like double talk until you start looking at it very closely. In the, it's actually in beginning, and that term is a little misleading in the English. It really means before time began. It's not like getting started. No, no. It's before time itself began. And we know today, see, you and I have the benefit of Einstein's theory of relativity. We may not know the math. That's not the point. But we know today that time is a physical property. Time varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity. And so the fact that you're dealing in the spirit world, means you're outside, doesn't mean you have lots of time, means you're outside time altogether is the point. So time varies with mass acceleration and gravity, obviously. So God is outside our time domain. This shows up even in the, in the linguistic structure here. In the beginning was the word. The Greek word is logos. And it's a mistake to assume that that word just simply means 
word like a word in a list, if you will. It's more than just a lexicographical term. It's a principle, thought, or concept is what it embraces. It's an expression or utterance of that concept. And it's interesting that this turns out to be a title. There are many, many titles you can put on Jesus Christ. You may titles you can give God. This is the highest. He puts this even above his name. There's all this Jewish interest in the name of God. They have all kinds of traditions about that. But here's his, this, is, this is his highest title. And uh, the word. In the Greek term, the word uh, uh, logos can be rendered word, like a, like a, but it's wrong if you think of it just as a, as a word in a list. The Greek has two other terms that primarily identify individual words, uh, with, like in a dictionary or something like that. This one is a, a high title for a concept that's being expressed, and, and the word was with God. Now, the word with there is pros in the Greek. It really means mutual fellowship and intercommunication, close personal relationship. It almost has the flavor of the Greek term koinonia, which is, the, is like being a fiduciary. And uh, Incidentally, if you go to the, you, you, you quickly recognize these words as being very similar to the opening book uh, lines of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And uh, if you look at uh, the uh, the word God in the Hebrew, it's Elohim. Elohim is a plural. And the word Elohim, every place it's used in the Old Testament, it's used as if it was singular, but it's actually a plural word. And uh, what's interesting about Hebrew plurals is that they require three or more. So that's actually a hint of the Trinity right here in the, in the first sentence of the Torah. But let's move. In, in beginning, it precedes time itself, before the world was, in other words. And the was is there is an imperfect in the, in the grammar, which means it implies continuous existence. In other words, coming into being. And, uh, and, the, and the word, of course, was the Alpha and the Omega, and it's used all through the scripture. Before the world was created, the word already existed is a better way to express that. That's a better way to represent the Greek. And then we add verse 3. And this is a shocker to many people to really realize what this says. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the very hill on which it stood. And what's interesting to me about this, since my personal background has been in the information sciences, Information science, per se, has become at the vanguard of every field of science. Um, whether you talk about physics and quantum physics, the challenges there is really are information issues, and biology, microbiology, DNA, and all of that's become an information science-dominated frontier. Darwinian views have a problem with the origin of information. They can't explain where that came from. The highest title of deity is the Logos. And... Uh, I love the de definition of truth. My wife came up with this when doing some research some time ago. Truth is when the word and the deed become one. And Jesus manifests that. That's what John is going to preoccupy himself with in this first chapter, is that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's an incredible thing. He continues, verse 4, In him was life, and life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. The light of men. And... Uh, he said, he'll say in chapter 8, I am the light of the world, and he emphasized that in chapter 9 also. And the darkness comprehended it not. And that word is a strange word. It means it wasn't overtaken. It wasn't, uh, uh, the, the darkness could not extinguish the light. And, uh, but John's summary of all this is that light will invade the dominion of darkness. Satan is the ruler, and his subjects resist the light, but will be unable to frustrate its power. And finally, the word will be victorious in spite of the opposition. That's the flavor. That's John's summary of what we're dealing with here. But it leads with a, it comes in with another word. We talked about logos as a special word. There's another word that we dwelled on last time. I'm just doing this lightly to get started here. And that is the word for light, or phos in the Greek, like photon or like photo and so forth. I've been haunted for over a year by a phrase that I think the Lord gave me in the middle of one night, that metaphors reign where mysteries reside. And the insight is that some of these words are more than just a metaphor. The metaphor is hiding something that has a secret hidden in it. And it's one of the continuing mysteries in physics is the nature of light. 
And we last time looked at three factors. The stu the, we looked at the two-slit paradox, relax, I'm not going to go through that again, the non-locality of photons, and the uh, holographic unit. These are fundamental mysteries to this day in the field of, uh, of, uh, of physics. And so it's, the, the word light itself has eluded um, full understanding in our most advanced sciences. We do know that the creation is now under a curse. Revelation redemption is by his word. And, he's, and uh, John will remind us that he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And so how do you discover God is the lurking question that we're all going to be asking. They do that by learning about Jesus. That's the net of all that. Jesus is God's manifestation to us. And so let's just jump in to start the narrative. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Don't confuse this John. This is John the Baptist. John the Apostle is writing the Gospel, but we're going to encounter a lot of discussion here about this very unusual guy by the name of John the Baptist. But continuing here, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. And he was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. And that's going to clarify here in a little bit. Now, John the Baptist is interesting. He was the last. In fact, he definitively closes the Old Testament. We're going to discover that the, Jesus will say that the law and the prophets were until John. The Old Testament didn't close with Malachi. It closed with John the Baptist. And he's going to make some very strange remarks. I'll defer that until we get into all that later. But he also, though, is the first herald, if you will, then in the New Testament. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. And here's the staggering statement. And the world knew him not. The more you know about him, the more you know about the, your Old Testament, the more you realize the extremes gone has gone to, that God has gone to for all, through all those years. It's astonishing that when the Messiah finally makes his appearance, they didn't know him. They didn't accept him. They didn't receive him. In fact, they murdered him. He was that true light. And so he came unto his own, his own received him not. This, if, if, a memory verses, this is probably one of your key ones in this chapter. Speaking of Jesus, he came unto his own, his own received him not, but, precious word, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now that phrase, sons of God, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, refers to a direct creation of God. And what he, it's not just a figure of speech here, it's an specific empowerment that we're going to have explained to us by Jesus himself in chapter 3. And uh, where does that term born again come from? Is it just an idiom or is there something special going on? And we're going to deal with that when we get to chapter 3. But this is the tragedy of Israel's whole history, is that they, he came to his own, his own received him not. And uh, so if you're a son of God, you're a new creation direct from God himself. As many as received him. Only the New Testament Use of receive is in this sense is receiving Christ. It's the only reference to that, by the way. It may surprise you. And uh, the Son of God here is used in the Old Testament sense. John and Paul use different terms uh, for believers, if you will. But we'll move on here. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And I say we'll expand on this in John 3, so I won't, this is intended just to be an opening review here. I don't want to get buried again in all these things. And predestination is implied here, and we'll get to that in ch on chapter 6 and ch chapter 10. In verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He dwelt. The Word is actually tabernacled. Interesting word. It's a tent. And he, tent he, he cast his tent among us. All of us in our tents, by the way. Did you realize that? Yeah. If I look out at you, I my problem is I can't see you. I only can see the temporary residence you're in. See, the real you isn't hardware, it's software. It's soul, call it soul, spirit, whatever. That's software, not hardware. It, it has no mass, which means it has no time. It's eternal whether you're saved or not. That's the problem. But we'll get more into that later. Um, and we beheld his glory, or inspected, if you will. And uh, his glory, and the word there is that it's just shaken out. And uh, the glories have the only begotten of the Father, and the absolute uniqueness of Jesus that John is going to really hit all through his 21 chapters here. This term tabernacle, though, is a very interesting uh, word, suggestive of many things. He, 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 dwelt, he tabernacled among us. What about a tab? What's it? Uh, how is God dwelling with us? Well, it's a temporary dwelling. It's a te just like we're living in a temporary dwelling. It's humble. It's outwardly unattractive. Uh, it's the center of the camp. 
It's a place where the law was preserved. It was a place of sacrifice, a place where the priests fed, and a place of worship. Those all characterized the tabernacle of the wilderness wanderings and also characterized, in a sense, the Messiah in his earthly ministry. But if we take a look at the tabernacle, as we find it in the Bible, and it's about visualized, I won't quarrel about a, a cubit, it's roughly, it's roughly 75 feet by 150 feet. All you see is a linen fence. All you see is the white linen fence. But if you go through, you come to the altar of sacrifice and then the laver, and then you get to the ho holy place, the tabernacle proper, if you will. And that's the part we want to understand because we it, it, there's a plate, the first room is called the holy place and a, a, the inner compartment is called the holy of holies. And uh, there's a door and then there is a menorah, the seven branch candlestick, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one plus the six makes the seven and so forth. We discover this great cosmic symbolism in every detail here. And the table of showbread and the golden altar, the altar of incense. And then there's a, the veil. And through the, through it, now in the Holy of Holies, there's the Ark of the Covenant, which had the, t the law, the tables of stone. On top of it, a separate piece of furniture, but not just the lid. It was a separate piece of furniture called the mercy seat. So these are the... They're counting the two things that are outside, there's seven pieces of furniture. Every one of those pieces of furniture speaks of Jesus Christ. And uh, what do I mean by that? He, the Word was made flesh and tabernacle among us. He says, I am the door. These are the I am statements coming out. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. And of course, the our incense is the intercession for us. And he's also our sin bearer and of course the propitiation for our sins. So he's, he's um, expressed in each, any one of those things. Well, let's get back to these words. In the beginning was the word we opened this up with, and then we had the word was made flesh. If we take the triplet that opened it, and the triplet we find in verse 14, it reads together, doesn't it? In the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh. The word was with God, the word dwelt among us. The word was God, full of grace and truth. We're not through, there'll be a triplet here that comes out of the next few verses here. So this was intended to be my review. So we'll try to go from here to with the rest of the chapter for the, for the, the, the next uh, 10 verses, if you will. So verse 15, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. John the Baptist turns out to be one of the most important guys in the uh, New Testament. He's spoken of at least 89 times. And, of course, he closes the Old Testament. And uh, so... Uh, he that cometh after me is preferred before me. And that, of course, is referring to Jesus, who clarifies all that in chapter 8. Because Jesus says, Before your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. And then said the Jews unto him, You're not yet 50 years old. Have you seen Jacob? He said, Have you seen Abraham? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am, deliberately using the phraseology of Exodus 4. But to he that cometh after me is preferred before me. Very key thing. Now, John was five months older, wasn't he? For he was before me. Sounds like double talk, doesn't it? He was before me. Could be an allusion to Micah 5, 2. Remember the born in Bethlehem, whose goings forth have been from everlasting, and so on. And uh, so there, this raises another interesting issue that I'll touch on to give you a little departure here. When was John the Baptist born? may surprise you. We can pin that down pretty well, it looks like. Um, Elizabeth was John's mother, was a cousin of Mary and the wife of a priest named Zechariah, who was of the course, or the subgroup, if you will, of Abijah. The priests were divided into 24 courses, and each course uh, uh, officiated in the temple for one week from Sabbath to Sabbath. And he was in the course of, the, of uh, Abijah. And uh, when the temple was destroyed by Titus in August 5th of 70 AD, the first course of priests had just taken office, we know from Josephus. Well, that's great. That gives us now a grid we can nail down because we know they changed every week for 24 weeks. So since the course of Vajra was the eighth course, we can track backwards and determine that Zacharias ended his duties, apparently, on July 13th of 3 BC. Okay, that's helpful. If the birth of John took place 280 days later, it would have been on April 19th to 20th, 2 BC, precisely on Passover of that year, interestingly enough. As Augustus died on August 19th, 14 AD, that was also the accession year for Tiberius, which is recorded in the Gospel of Luke. John began his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius, 
Okay? And so if John was born on April 19th of 2 BC, his 30th birthday, he had to wait till he was 30 to be a, uh, uh, you know, a prophet and so on, his 30th birthday would have been on April 19th, 20, uh, 29 AD, or the 15th year of Tiberius. It ties together, interestingly enough. Okay? John's repeated introduction of Jesus as the Lamb of God is interesting because John was indeed born on Passover that year, interestingly enough. And uh, this seems to confirm 2 BC as the birth date. And since John was five months older, this would also confirm an autumn birth date for Jesus. Okay? Never dawned on me, I think. Here in New Zealand, you're probably closer to the real birthday than we are in America, if you will, strangely enough. Elizabeth hid herself for five months, and then the angel Gabriel announced to Mary both Elizabeth's condition and that Mary would also bear a son who would be called Jesus. Mary went in haste to visit Elizabeth, who was taken in, uh, in the first week of her sixth month of the fourth week of December 3rd, uh, December 3rd BC. If Jesus was born 280 days later, it would place the date of his birth on September 29th, 2 BC. Now, many different scholars have different guesses as to when his birth date was. This isn't the only one. It's the one that, to me, is the head, had the most support, but it doesn't mean it's correct either. There's obviously some number of places that this could be have some variability. But uh, if Jesus was born on September 29th, 2 BC, it's interesting, because in that year, th th uh, that year, that was the first petitory, the day of Yom Teruah, the uh, Feast of Trumpets. So that some people make a lot of it. I wouldn't make too much of it, because it may not be correct, but it's an interesting thing. And so this is just one of the possible conjectures. Let's move on. Verse 16, and of his fullness we have all received the grace for grace, and the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And a grace is God's favor, and kindness bestowed on those who do not deserve it, cannot earn it. You understand the difference between grace and mercy. Grace is getting something you don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what you do. Okay. They are very similar, but they're two, two okay. Now this leads us to another metaphor. As you know from last time, I like to nail some of these down because metaphors can often masquerade to hide the fact that we're, there's underlying mysteries that we have yet to resolve. We talked about logos at some length last time. We talked about light last time. This word grace is arguably the most amazing of the three. And yes, we have a song, Amazing Grace, that understates it even there. The, grace, the more you understand the grace of God, the more astonishing it is. Titus summarized it in chapter 3. He says, uh, The kindness and love of God our Savior toward man, not by works of righteousness which we have done. That's the, the capsule issue. So it's always set in contrast with the law, under which God demands righteousness from man, as under grace he gave righteousness to man. That's the contrast. The law blesses the good. Grace saves the bad. The law demands that blessings be earned. Grace is a free gift. And it's astonishing. Despite all the trouble we have trying to understand the law, and we have all, all of us have various quibbles about that, an even bigger problem that we struggle with is coming to terms with the fact that grace is a free gift. That's why I make the, the, the statement that Jesus Christ is the most anti-religious person that ever walked the earth. You have to be careful. What do you, what you mean by religion? Religion is man's attempt to reconcile himself with God. He can't. All, all these things that we think we should be doing are man's attempts to reconcile himself with God. He can't do it. God has done the whole job, and he's jealous about that. Trying to add to what he's completed, he, consid he considers insulting. Strangely enough, so this grace thing is, is not as simple as it sounds at first. And so, in Jesus Christ, grace and truth reach their fullness. And this fullness is available to us, and that's really why we're all here. Truth is when the word and the deed become one. We are saved by grace, but, uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 8. But we also live by grace. Not only are we saved by grace, we live by grace and depend on God's grace in all that we do. And that's the tough thing to learn. That's why we're so grateful for Paul's writings because he really elaborates all of that, not only in Ephesians, but 1 Corinthians and, and so on and so forth. Let's continue with some other problems here. Um, no man hath seen God at any time. 
the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. And uh, see, no man has seen God. They've only seen representations of Him. And uh, God is spirit, as, as will be explained when we get to John chapter 4. It's going to get into that again. And so, the only begotten Son is the bosom of the Father. These are three re-expressions back from verse 14, in effect, that uh, He hath declared Him. And yet, you know, didn't, didn't Isaiah say, My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty? Isaiah claims to have seen Him, but that again, it's a representation of Him. God in His essence is invisible, Paul tells First Timothy, uh, Timothy's first letter in chapter 1. He speak, in First Timothy 6, he says, He is the one whom no one has seen or can see. You can see representations of Him, but you can't see the, His true essence. No one has ever seen God's essential nature, is what verse 18 is trying to get at here. God can be seen in what we call a theophany, an appearance, an anthropomorphism, but his inner essence or nature is disclosed only in Jesus. Now, if we take those triplets, remember we took the, in the beginning was the Word, and then the Word was made flesh. Turns out, if you take these, they, they, they flay pretty nicely. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was made flesh, no man hath seen God at any time. The Word was with God, the Word dwelt among us, the only begotten Son was the bosom of the Father. The Word was God, full of grace and truth. He hath declared Him. It's interesting how this thing flows. You get a sense of some choreography going on here. Verse 19, and this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? He confessed, and I not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. John is preaching at Bethabara, which is uh, on the, at the Jordan. If you're in Jerusalem and you want to go down there, it's, it's a 20, 30 mile drive in a rent a car, okay? They didn't, ha I don't think they had Avis or Hertz back then. But there are so many people that are going from Jerusalem to Bethabara to hear John the Baptist that the temple has put together an inquiry team to find out what's going on. He's drawing a huge crowd over 20 miles away on foot. Okay, so they came to ask him, "Who are you?" And he confessed, "Sitting tonight, I'm not the confessed." They presume maybe he thinks he's the Messiah. No, that's it. And by the way, when John uses the word "the Jews," that's what we call a synecdoche. When you use the specific for the general, or the general for the specific, it's a, it's a figure of speech. John is using the term "Jews" to speak of the leadership of the Jews. And that's that occurs in a number of critical places that has led to misunderstandings that have been exploited in, of centuries of abuse to the Jews. Who, who killed the Messiah? It was my sins on that, put them on that cross. The idea that Jews didn't, oh, the Jews didn't, they have the legal right to, the Romans had to do it for them. So there's all that anti-Semitism that's built around a misunderstanding of phrases in the Gospel of John. John uses that term to refer to the leadership. It's been analyzed by some scholars that less than 13 people probably could account for the whole thing. I'll move on here. He's using the title for the city's uh, leaders. Everybody's anti the, the temple people are anticipating one of three answers. The Messiah is one of them. He's expected because of Micah 5, 2 and Isaiah 9, 6, and you know all the verses there. Elijah was expected because of Malachi. And uh, the prophet of Moses is mentioned in Deuteronomy 18. So there's three kinds of possibilities that the temple inquirers could expect. Does he think he's the Messiah? Is, does he think he's Elijah come back? Or is he that prophet that Moses made an illusion? Those are the three possibilities that keep coming up, by the way, in several places. Now, the, Messi the Messiah anticipation comes from three different places. Uh, we'll notice that when we get to Luke chapter 2 in our studies, um, Simeon was expecting the Messiah and was treated to seeing the baby there, and Luke records that. And Anna, same thing, same kind of a thing. She also, these are two people that were expecting the Messiah and recognized Christ in, as, a, as a babe, uh, in the in the temple temple proceedings, recorded in Ocean Luke. And when we get to later on to what we call the triumphal entry, we'll discover uh, that Gabriel told Daniel five centuries earlier the exact day that Jesus would ride that donkey, presenting himself as king. And the shocker there will be that Jesus held him accountable to know that. That's a, that's a, that's the the obverse of that whole issue, and we'll get to a lot of that later. They asked him then, what then? Are you Elias? He said, no, I'm not. Are you that prophet, meaning the prophet of Moses? He said, no. 
That prophet is a, uh, the one that was uh, predicted in Deuteronomy 18. Now, this leads to uh, a couple of other issues. The possibility of future roles for both Moses and Elijah. Elijah's no problem because he never died. Remember, he was raptured, if I can use that expression or translate it. Moses has also had his ministry interrupted. And, uh, uh, and we find Michael is fighting over with Satan over his body. What's all that about? See, three were expected, as we notice here. The Messiah, Elijah, and there's confusion about whether John the Baptist wasn't Elijah because he came in the spirit of uh, Elijah. But he himself indicates he was not literally Elijah. And, of course, Moses, as I pointed out. Now, John the Baptist did have an Elijah-type ministry. He appeared on the scene suddenly and even dressed like Elijah. He sought to turn the people back to God as Elijah did in his way. This gives me an excuse to mention a legend. Um, the legend that he's wearing Elijah's mantle. That there's, a, there's a Jewish legend that uh, I never took seriously, except I've discovered a few things might have made it possible, but we still don't know it's true, that he's actually wearing Elijah's mantle. And so, now Malachi had predicted that Elijah would return before Messiah's coming. And uh, he may still do that. That may be what's going on in Revelation 11. So, so there may people uh, speculate that John was Elijah, literally. Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah, said the prophet Isaiah. He's quoting Isaiah 40, verse 3, by the way. And uh, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight the desert a highway for God. John the Baptist is quoting the Old Testament. And that's his role. He's not one of those three guys. He has got a mission of his own. Okay. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither prophet? If not one of those three guys, what are you doing baptizing is the question. Now the Pharisees are uh, numbered about 6,000. They were very influential. And uh, they held a very strict interpretation of the law. And they also embraced many oral traditions in addition. Those oral traditions later get documented in the 3rd century AD, 3rd uh, through the 8th, into what's called the Talmud trying to document what they call the oral law. And uh, they were the, the Pharisees were the only minor group that survived the uh, Jewish War of 66 to 70 AD. And their teaching has formed the basis of Talmudic Judaism, I said. Do you want to answer something? I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. Now, this is where I'm going to send you off on your own little side trip. You might want to go and study shoes throughout the scripture. You can take one of these things and run with it, and you'll discover something interesting. It seems that the Holy Spirit uses these idioms consistently. Whether you're talking about Exodus or you're talking shoes. Uh, the burning bush. What did God tell Moses to do? Take off your shoes. You're on a hallowed ground, right? And when he gets the Ten Commandments in Exodus 19. And then Joshua. Forty years later, one night, after dinner, he gets confronted, and he challenges this stranger like a sentry, and the stranger says, take off your shoes, you're on all your own. And Joshua realizes who it is, it's the Lord Jesus. Joshua didn't fight the battle of Jericho, Jesus did. In the last verses of chapter 5, read that carefully, and you'll discover that every rule in the Torah was violated in the battle of Jericho. It becomes a model, a structural model, of the book of Revelation. It's another old study to get into. In, the, in uh, uh, Ruth and Boaz, that shoe became a marriage license in that whole plot scheme. And of course, John the Baptist's respect here thus is an echo of all of those in my mind, so you can chase them down on your own. All these things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John is baptizing. That's a spot on the Jordan, just opposite Jericho. And you now, today, can baptize there because there's a deal with the, Jor uh, the Jordan government. And we do our groups there now, just recently, because that arrangement has been made with Jordan. And so it's a, it's a more pleasant place than is usually used, which is a, I won't get into all here. Anyway, that's the, you can actually get baptized there if you choose to, and uh, at Bethabar, which means the house of passage. That's where Joshua first came across, Gilgal and all that. The next day John seeth Jesus coming to him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Here is John's public introduction, first introduction publicly, of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And he uses a very Jewish label here. Behold the Lamb of God. And uh, this is, uh, it's interesting, every one of the feasts of Israel, there's seven of them, are pregnant with prophecy issues as well as historical memorabilia. They all have historical reasons, but they also have a prophetic role that is, is very uh, great study to get into. And uh, when you study the Abraham's offering of Isaac, and Abraham and Isaac are going up the hill back in Genesis 22, and the, the kid says, Where, uh, we got the wood, and the, where's, the, where's the lamb? And Abraham says in verse 8 there, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Most people don't pick up that Abraham knew he was acting out a prophecy because he names the place in the mount of the Lord shall be seen. And 2,000 years later, on that very spot, another father would offer his son as an offering for sin. And it's interesting that the Lamb of God is idiomatic then of Passover and of, 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 of the, the, the atoning death of Christ. And so, by the way, this also proves that uh, Cain was wrong and Abel was right. That uh, Abel uh, br um, brought a lamb in accordance to God's instruction. You got There's a whole background there that uh, you wanted to get into. Um, verse 30, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me. I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And then John, it's interesting, it, he doesn't give the detail, uh, the, uh, uh, like Mark and the others, about this whole event. But he does mention, he, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And so, come like a dove. Verse 34, And I saw the, and bear record that this is the Son of God. And this is one of the places that uh, the, the Trinity is visible. Because Jesus is there, obviously. The Holy Spirit is descending on him. Like, not, a, not a dove, but like a dove. And the voice of the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So all three are uh, uh, manifested in that event. And again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus, he walked with, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. There he does it again, see. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And uh, then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? He said unto him, Rabbi, which is to be interpreted meaning master, where dwellest thou? He said, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt. They abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak, John the Baptist speak, that is, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah. Now, Andrew is one of the two disciples who followed Jesus. He was the first proclaimer of Jesus the Messiah in, in John's gospel. And he appears two more times. Both times, he's always bringing someone to Jesus. You gotta, that's why people like to adopt you know, Andrew as a ministry a label themselves. And the unnamed disciple here is commonly held to be John, the son of Zebedee, the author of this gospel. He doesn't mention himself, but that's just a form of humility. Uh, John, the son of Zebedee, who's a brother of James, also son of Zebedee, obviously, and author of this gospel. So he's the unnamed disciple here. That there are two pairs of brothers, Simon and Andrew, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee. These four are fishermen. There were at least seven of the disciples that were fishermen, by the way, before we're through here. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is, by interpretation, a stone. And uh, so uh, Cephas is the Aramaic, if you will because Jesus knew his character, and Peter is the Greek translation of Cephas, which means rock. Cephas is his name in the Arabic, but the, the Aramaic means rock, and that's where you get Peter. Peter is the Greek rendering of the rock, Petrus. Anyway, Simon's name in Hebrew is probably a Simeon, incidentally. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find a Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. And Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. 
So this is a whole collection of Galileans. There's only one that wasn't a Galilean, Judas Iscariot. Though the first disciples were from Galilee, Jesus called them in, in they called him, they're from Galilee, but they called him in Judea when they were with John the Baptist, but he's heading up north, if you will. And it's on his way to the Galilee that he called Philip to be a disciple. And his hometown was Bethsaida, which is on the northeast uh, corner of the Sea of Galilee. And Andrew and Peter, of course, both born there. And then he findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And uh, it's interesting that Philip's testimony to Nathaniel stressed that he is the promised one of the text. And uh, you can track those down if you like. The text where uh, uh, is emphasized. And uh, Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? <laughs> That's a, apparently a proverb of the day. There are actually two prophets that did come out of, out of that area. But that's neither here nor there. Philip saith unto him, he says, can anything good thing come out of Nazareth? Kind of a negative view. Philip says, come and see. He doesn't answer him. He says, come and check it out. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Doesn't sound like much to us, but it sure shook him up. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Apparently Nathanael was meditating on his own, thought he was alone. And Jesus knew that. And the fact that he knew that blew it doesn't impress us, but it certainly impressed Nathanael. And he knew the facts here. And it goes on here then. We, uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, there were times that the crowds wanted to make Jesus king, but he refused them. In John 6, we'll see that happen. He did present himself as a king in John 12. And he affirmed to Pilate that he was born a king. But we'll move on here. Because Nathaniel learns it that early is the point I was trying to make there. He answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under a fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Wow. And uh, so, by the way, one of the things we realize as we go through John, John will assume that his readers are familiar with the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Luke, and, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they each record the transfiguration. John makes reference to it. That was one of them just now. And there's a couple of places where he alludes to it, but he takes for granted his readers are familiar with that. So we want to take a short detour and take a look at this for a minute here. This, this was a, this, his remark there at the end of that chapter was apparently a prophecy of the transfiguration, which shows up Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke 9. And uh, it's my perception that the transfiguration, besides being a transfiguration of the Christ, is a staff meeting. Because they have a discussion going on that we can infer from the writings of the guys that were present there. Okay? And there's a very provocative attendance list in this meeting. <laughs> the two witnesses in Revelation will impact on all of this. So when we talk about this, we are, there were three expected, the Messiah, the Elijah, and Moses from the, from, the, from the text. And John the Baptist says he's not none of those. There were two ministries that were unfinished. Moses' ministry was interrupted by the Rephidim and the, his misbehavior there that in Numbers 20 and recounted in De Deuteronomy 3. Elijah was caught up, his, uh, uh, was translated. And uh, Elijah had eight miracles. Elisha followed him around, wanted a double portion. And if you study Elisha's thing, he did 16. So he apparently got his double portion. But... Uh, Everybody speculates about the two witnesses in Revelation 11. They all figure it's Enoch and Elijah because they didn't die. They're both translated, except there's some problems with it. I take the view that it couldn't be Elijah, uh, Enoch. It, it isn't necessarily Enoch. And everybody says it has to be Enoch because of Hebrews 9.27. is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. That's, the gen that's a rebuttal of reincarnation. And that's, uh, uh, there are exceptions to that, though. And... Uh, it's a general rule, not exception. There are exceptions. Lazarus in John 11 was an exception. He died twice. Jairus' daughter in Mark 5 and Luke 8. 
uh, the widow of Nain's son in Luke 7. These are people, there are others too, that were raised from the dead. That doesn't mean they have the resurrection bodies. They were raised from the dead. There's a technical difference there. And so uh, the, the, the Hebrews 9.27 doesn't require the witnesses to be uh, Enoch, if you will. And furthermore, Enoch really wasn't Jewish. He was pre-Abraham in the first place. And both the witnesses are witnesses uh, to Israel. And so they, they are identified in Revelation 11 by unique powers and the miracles they can do. Elijah had, was unique that he does fire from heaven and he shut heaven with, uh, with rain for three, for, for three and a half years, which doesn't come out in the Old Testament text, but is mentioned twice by James and Jesus himself in the New Testament. So you put that together, it really does fit. And then Moses, of course, did his, turned the water into blood, which is described, and also all manner of plagues. So the four definitive gifts that these guys enjoyed in Revelation 11 are unique to both uh, Elijah and Moses. Doesn't mean this is correct. This is why some of us believe that the two will be Moses and Elijah. And so, and that also unlocks, starts to deal with another mystery. Why on earth did Michael contend with Satan over the body of Moses? What's all that about? Nobody knows. It's a strange illusion in the book of Jude. So, uh, was this a staff meeting during the transfiguration? I suspect it was. Who was present? Moses and Elijah was present. That's why I'm getting into this here. And uh, the subjects they discussed included, Jesus spoke of his crucifixion, Luke tells us in Luke chapter 9. That was discussed there. Uh, his sufferings and glory were a subject of discussion from 1 Peter 1. And his second coming was a subject of discussion in 2 Peter 1. P Peter makes reference to those things. They're just hints. But from that we infer these things, discussions going on with Jesus, of course, who is being transfigured, and Moses and Elijah who are present. So uh, the, uh, there's another interesting thing about location. The only guy that I found uh, that p picked up on this was Doug Wetmore, head of Firefighters for Christ. We were close friends. He's now with the Lord, knows the truth. I'd love to know what it is. He, is the mountain of the transfiguration the same location that Moses' sepulcher and Elijah's departure took place? Could very well be. Uh, Elijah's translation was across the Jordan, just east of Jericho, apparently. Moses' sepulchre is at Beth Peor, at the base of Mount Nebo, apparently. And the transfiguration we know is not in Galilee. So a lot of the traditional sites that people talk about are not correct. Does that mean that this one is correct? Don't know, but it's provocative. It's kind of interesting if that all happened, if there's some geographic thing. So we just made it, believe it or not. I didn't. Um, so we've completed chapter 1. And uh, it took us two sessions to do that. That will not be our typical practice. We'll normally go about a chapter a week going through with very only uh, one or two difficulties that might take a, a split session. So, But I want you for next time to study John chapter 2. And in that you'll find a couple of topics, one of which, of course, is the wedding at Cana. And so we're going to learn a little bit about that. There's two events there. The changing of the water to wine. Why did John pick that one, that miracle, first? And uh, it happened on the third day. What third day? What is that all about? How is that significant? And what is distinctive about the water that was used? Everybody talks about the water being wine. Pay attention as to what water was used and see if you can do some homework on that. And we'll try to unravel that because that will take you into the whole issue of the red heifer and all that that most people overlook. And we'll let that go. The second event that will also conclude the next session will be the cleansing of the temple. And uh, uh, that has implications for all. There's some lessons in that for us also. So that's your thing for next time. Uh, and let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we just praise you. We thank you for this chapter. We thank you for your word. We, we just pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would help us apprehend what these metaphors really include. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for its depth. But we also thank you, Father, for the practical lessons. We pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit, you would help us to apply these insights and understandings to our walk every day as we commit ourselves indeed without any reservations whatsoever into your hands in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus, our coming King indeed. Amen.